Thank you, Julian. It's great to be here at the library uh, with this uh, speaker's event. Uh, we're very excited to have today with us Charles Pappas from Exhibitor Magazine, based out there in Minnesota. And we wanted to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about, you know, why is the department, why is the Undersecretary's Office organizing this today? Well, in January of 2017, in the Office of the Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, we reestablished a international expositions unit to help manage our relations with the international organization, the Bureau of International Expositions based in Paris, to organize our pavilions at expos overseas, such as the one coming up in Dubai in 2020, as well as to support candidacies here in the United States by cities or states that want to join the map and host a World's Fair here in the United States. We haven't had a World's Fair since 1984 in New Orleans, but last year in 2017, Minneapolis, the state of, with the state of Minnesota, came forward with our first candidacy. And that was something that I was able to advance all the way to the final round in November of 2017, where the Deputy Secretary addressed the General Assembly in Paris. And the Minnesotans were very excited about this opportunity to try to bring the World's Fair back to the United States. But as we kind of saw in our campaign, there's a lot of questions of what are, what are these things? Do we still do these World's Fairs? Like, are they still important? And we were lucky enough to have uh, Charles come out with a book last year, 2017, that he's going to talk about a little bit today, and all the things that have come out of the World's Fairs. And today he's going to talk to you not only about the book, but also about how the world sees these activities, why they matter, and why the United States should be there. So. Uh, Charles Pappas has covered the exhibition industry for Exhibitor Magazine since 2002 and spent years sleuthing out the not only the economic impact, but also the cultural impact of World's Fairs and Trade Fairs, which is chronicled in his book, Flying Cars, Zombie Dogs, and Robot Overlords. He is part of the team at Exhibitor Magazine that has evaluated and recognized best-in-class pavilion and exhibition design at World's Fairs through the magazine's Expo Awards programs. And the United States pavilions have in the past competed for some of the awards, and we're looking forward to Dubai in 20. 20 competing once again. But without further ado, Mr. Charles Pappas, thank you. Thank you, Matt, and thank you for having me here today. We talk a lot about exhibitions because they're some of the most powerful change agents in history. When you think of a, a World's Fair, it's something that isn't really much on American minds anymore. But in many ways, almost everything you do, almost everything you use, is in some ways related to a World's Fair. Something that hit a tipping point or was launched at one. Every time you zip up something, every time you drink a glass of a Bordeaux, every time you stick something into an electrical socket, every time, frankly, you use the alternating current system of electricity, every time you ride an elevator or an escalator, or you drive a Ford Mustang, or you have a glass of cherry Coke, or you use a touch screen, or you watch an IMAX movie, you're doing something that was launched at or hit critical mass at a World's Fair. And I emphasize the word worlds in that, because at their best, they drew as many as 75 million people. In fact, for the 1900 one in France, something like 50 million showed up when France had a population of 41 million. 25% of America, it's estimated, saw the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago. 45 million came in 1939 to New York. 60 million to Expo 67 in Montreal when Canada had something like 20 million people as a population. And again, the top was Shanghai in 2010 with 75 million people. When you have that many people and you're promoting anything from your country to your brand, you have a chance to change world history very, very quickly. We've forgotten this a bit in America simply because we haven't had a fair here, as Matthew said, since 1984 in New Orleans. And in fact, people often ask me when I tell them that I'm going to Kazakhstan or Milan for a World's Fair, do they still have those? And they do still have those. But in fact, because there have been something like 19 fairs in America, depending on how you count them, 
They are as American as apple pie, and in fact, they brought us a part of America itself. Statue of Liberty, we owe in part to a World's Fair. When Bartholdi had repurposed his design from one that he was originally going to build in Egypt to another one he thought would be acceptable for American audiences, he decided to crowdsource much of the funding. So at the 1876 Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia, he gave us the arm. You could climb up it for the fee of 50 cents, not a small sum in those days, walk around the torch, and then when you walked down, you exited, guess what, through the gift shop, which was a concept a lot older than many of us think. But again, one actually kind of popularized at World's Fairs. And of course, in certainly about 10 years later, he was able to crowdsource the funds for it successfully, and in fact, had done this again with the arm at the 1878 exposition in Paris as well. But it proved a wildly popular thing to do. Now this raises the question about, you know, when I talk about World's Fairs, it seems a little bit hyperbolic and maybe a little bit of a fairy tale. So maybe it's appropriate that in many ways they started literally in a palace. For the 1851 exhibition of the works of industry of all nations in London, which was the first official World's Fair, the British government wanted a design for a main building, a statement that would show off Britain's ingenuity and its world leadership. Again, World's Fairs are used to brand your country, often successfully. They had 245 proposals, and with two weeks left before the deadline, they had rejected all of them, every single one of them as too drab, too boring, or too basic. And that was when a horticulturalist slash architect named Joseph Paxton decided, I think I can do this. So during a meeting one day, he doodled on a piece of paper a design based on the giant Amazonian water lily, named, of course, for Queen Victoria. In nine days, he had the full design. The committee accepted it, hands down, right away. And it gave us the Crystal Palace. <clears throat> 1,848 feet wide, 108 feet long, 10 stories high, made of prefab iron and glass. And really, based on the water lily, it's the first biomorphic architecture. Trend setting, groundbreaking, and it was beloved right away. Inside, you could fit 14,000 exhibits. There were eight miles of display tables. And it was so big and so outsized, literally, for its era, that urban legends began to spring up immediately about it. My favorite was the one that so many sparrows infested the upper regions of it that they had to train an armada of hawks to come in and take them out. Not true. But what is true is that it set the standard for what made a successful World's Fair. And one of those parts, one of the part of that template, is statement architecture. Usually something not just innovative, but radical for its time. The mother of those, obviously, the Eiffel Tower, for the 1889 exposition in Paris. What many people don't know is that as much as the palace was beloved, this was detested. It was absolutely hated. The French intelligentsia dismissed it as a tragic street lamp. They wrote op-ed after op-ed about what a travesty it was. And one of them declared that even barbaric Americans would understand how ugly this was. Well, maybe, maybe it's understandable when you, th when you think about what might have taken its place. There were 700 proposals for this. And one of them, one of the more interesting ones, was a colossal watering can. My favorite was the 1,000 foot tall guillotine. Apparently, it would have been a working model, and I really have to admit, I, I would like to have seen that. <laughs> but when this was done, nonetheless, it gained acceptance slowly. And what's kind of interesting is, even though Eiffel had the political clout and enough support to get it built, there were many who thought it might really bomb, nonetheless. And it had a kind of a shelf life. It was supposed to be disassembled after 20 years. 
So given that, given that many thought it might fail, Eiffel proposed that I'll shoulder the burden for much of the financing if you give me the licensing rights. That means all the souvenirs, all the restaurants that have been in there, he would get the money for. The organizers thought we might be getting something for nothing with this deal, so they went for it, and actually pretty understandably. But given that in 2010, the tower received its 250 millionth visitor, I think we can kind of declare who the winner in that one was. Interesting note to this. They debated disassembling and reassembling it for the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis. Eiffel considered it, but he thought there were still so many in the French government who were against it that he might not get the ability to rebuild it in France again, so he left it alone. And he decided not to take it down and bring it to St. Louis for that. Again, statement architecture, buildings that are often beloved. This is a painting by Charles Graham of the Palace of Fine Arts for the 1893 Columbian Exposition in Chicago. Later became the Museum of Science and Industry. So more than 120 years old and still a kind of a standard of fine architecture to this day. And of course, you also have the Art Institute of Chicago, which was built at the same time for the 1893 fair. The Atomium in Brussels for Expo 58. An iron crystal atom magnified 165 billion times. And again, this was one of those instantly successful efforts at architecture, statement architecture for a World's Fair, and of course coinciding with the nuclear age. And that was what this fair was centered on. There's a restaurant now in the middle of it, and you can go up to the top observation deck that's about 335 feet high. The Space Needle for Century 21 Exposition in Seattle. Here you had another doodle on a napkin that a fair organizer drew and then made into reality. About 605 feet high, and today it still looks gorgeous. Almost looks a little bit like that googie architecture in Los Angeles that's kind of Jetsons-like in its appearance. But it's still considered a statement architecture. In 50 years, it's not out of date. From Expo 2010 in Shanghai, the Chinese wanted Expo 2010 to be much like the Olympics, a statement about their emergence on the world stage. And that's often what the most unforgettable pieces of architecture at Expos become. This was perhaps the most expensive pavilion done in Expo history. It cost about $220 million. It's about 22 stories high, and it's made, though, out of a traditional architecture called dugong of 56 interlocking brackets that fit together like Lego pieces. That's all it really is. It's now been turned into the largest art museum in Asia. But this stood out among all other pavilions. It was the tallest and the most unusual. And then there's a subtle subtext, a kind of a subtle internal political message, because each one of the 56 brackets represents a Chinese minority. Now, great designs meet great designers. Mies van der Rohe, Le Corbusier, worked on World's Fair pavilions. Daniel Burnham. Uh, Stanford White worked on them. So did Salvador Dali. For the 1939 World's Fair in New York, he was approached to do a pavilion. His first idea was to create a large interior space and fill it with giraffes that he would then explode in front of a live audience. His financial backers were less than enthused about that. So he came up with an alternate idea. He called it the Dream of Venus. The outside of it was a somewhat rectangular pavilion, and I say somewhat because it looks like melted marshmallow, just sort of coalesced. Human limbs seem to be punching their way or crawling their way out of it, kind of like a nightmare cross between H.P. Lovecraft and The Walking Dead. To get inside, you went to the ticket booth, which was a giant fish head. There's Dali and his wife Gala sitting inside. And when you went inside, you encountered a 36-foot-long bed 
where a topless model lies under a canopy of rubber telephones and umbrellas while narration occurs around you, pointing you to her dreams. And one of the dreams, one of the most interesting is a large transparent water tank in which more topless models with belts covering their nether regions but with live lobsters attached swam playing a piano made in the shape of a mermaid and milking a mummified cow as one does. No wonder about 10 years later, uh, Wallace Laboratories contracted him to do the first exhibit to popularize the tranquilizer in Milltown. This is another one of my favorites. Buckminster Fuller was another contemporary of Dali's, one of the most seminal architects and designers. He was brought into the World's Fair world because of the Jeshan International Fair in 1956. Now these are somewhat similar to World's Fairs, but they're more ideological and they have fewer nations. They're more combative than collaborative, let's say. At this one in Afghanistan, we were up against the Chinese and the Soviets. Again, to curry favor with the local country and the region. Soviets built a pavilion to highlight their work finishing the world's highest highway that they had just built for the Afghans in the Hindu Kush. The Chinese were building kind of a giant golden calf version of Chairman Mao. But with a little more than 30 days left, we had nothing. We had nothing. So some U.S. officials suggested we put up circus tents. That's what we had. The director of the pavilion, Jack Macy, who's a real hallowed name and somewhat forgotten today, but who had worked for the U.S. Information Agency, approached Buckminster Fuller and said, can you do a geodesic dome within 30 days? Fuller said yes. He had just debuted it two years previously at a Milan trade fair, and he's pretty confident he could kind of produce one very, very quickly. In less than 30 days, he shipped over 480 color-coded parts that were, th that were then put up into this form. Now it's brilliant on two levels. One is it looks like a yurt, the traditional housing of nomadic tribes in the Central Asian region. But by being color-coded, they could do something the Soviets and the Chinese couldn't. They could hire indigenous labor and pay them. Maybe they didn't speak English, maybe they weren't literate, but they could pay them to put the color-coded pieces together and foster goodwill that way. It was the hit. It clearly outshined what the other guys did, especially since inside there was a working movie studio and a mechanical talking chicken. Now, after that, Fuller became a mainstay, though, of World's Fairs. He, um, he was used for in 1964 at the New York Fair and the Biosphere in Expo 67 at Montreal, which still stands today and has been refurbished and is now kind of an ecology museum. He was also used again a couple years later, a few years later, in 1959, at the National Exhibition in Moscow, the one where Nixon had the famous tish with Khrushchev in the kitchen. Well, there was another designer, Ray and Charles Eames. Mid-century designers, gorgeous ideas, and they were brought in to do a multimedia epic. Fuller built another geodesic dome for them, about 20 stories high, and they did the first multi-screen theater in the world. Seven 20 by 30 foot screens. This is, a, you know, this is kind of a joke photo they made afterwards. But so many Russians attended that they wore grooves in the concrete floors within a few weeks. This was so popular that the Eames were brought back for the 64 World's Fair in New York by IBM. You stood under this giant replica of the ball that worked the Selectric typewriter with IBM embossed in 3D 1,000 times outside of it, and you stood under a grove of 45 steel trees 30 feet tall. It was a seminal work, and you can see that those, those lines are real. I was there, and I stood in that line for hours just to get in. It was that popular. One of my favorites, Thomas Heatherwick, 2010 for Shanghai. This is Britain's pavilion, otherwise known as the Seed Cathedral. 
It was made of 60,000 25 foot long fiber optic rods, each with a seed in it from a seed bank in Britain, whose goal is kind of a doomsday scenario of collecting at least 25% of the world's seeds in case of a catastrophe. During the day, the rods were translucent, so light came in and lit the interior. During the night, the rods light up and create kind of an unearthly glow around it. And because the rods are loose, they wave constantly in the air. And it creates an optical illusion. You can kind of see if you look around the edge, it creates the illusion of fading in and out from reality, as if it's entering one dimension and leaving another at the same time. It was utterly hypnotic, and it's become almost, it's kind of, it's, if you will, sort of a template for a new generation of Expo architecture. Expo 2015 in Milan, Daniel Liebeskind worked for Vanka, a Chinese real estate company. He created a four-story dragon, like something out of Game of Thrones, except it's made of 4,200 ceramic plates made of feld, uh, quart, feldspar quartz and clay with a metallic oxide glaze that allows it to change from white to red here to yellow throughout the day, depending on how the sun hits it. And not to be forgotten, the U.S. exhibit at Milan 2015. James Bieber from New York did this. Coney Island Boardwalk was reassembled to lead you in, but on the outside is basically a kinetic sculpture, the world's largest vertical farm. 7,200 square feet, 42 types of grains and crops from uh, mint to Merlot lettuce. And it's moving because the plants are being moved to be watered and to move in and out of the sunlight throughout the day highlighting new technology, which is really much of what expos also do, introducing us to the things that are going to change your life and forcing them almost to hit mass popularity. Going back to the first American World's Fair, 1853 in New York, again, talking about products and technology. This is Elisha Otis. This is almost 170 years ago, and he wanted to prove his safety elevator was superior to any other kind of manual elevator. Now, elevators have been around since Rome, in the Colosseum, for that matter. His, though, had the innovation of being one in which you would not plunge to your death. So he raised it above the crowd, and he took the rope that hoisted it up, and he cut it in two. And the crowd did let out a collective gasp at that point, because as far as they're concerned, you know, one and one equals two. Cut the rope, you crash. Nothing happened. That cemented him with the thousands and thousands of attendees as the elevator. And think about it. How many other elevator brands do you know today? They operate, I think, a total of 80 million elevators and escalators, by the way, which they introduced at the 1900 World's Fair in Paris. They run 80 million of them today. It's set in the public mind an indelible, set-in-stone image of a product for almost two centuries. 1878 in Paris, that World Expo, produced a technology way ahead of its time. Augustin Mouchot demonstrated solar power. The disk you see actually converted sunlight to heat up steam in the black container under it. The steam, in turn, powered a refrigeration unit that made ice. He won the gold medal at the fair for this, for solar power. So why didn't it take off? Because at the same time, the railroad network in Europe and America was expanding so quickly, and the prices of fossil fuels, coal and oil, had dropped so much that it became economically viable to still use those. And I kind of wonder, what if we had had 140 years of linear development of solar power after this? It was so far ahead of its time, it was almost too much ahead of its time at the fair. But it was a world's fair, nonetheless, that demonstrated this to the public. 1889 in Paris. This is Thomas Edison's exhibit. And he hogged, by the way, nearly 75% of all the American space at that World's Fair. And no one complained. 
Here he's introducing the phonograph. He put 25 of them out, and you could listen to people speak in as many as 50 languages, as well as the French national anthem. Uh, and then he had individuals come up and use these little, these little kind of proto earbuds, much like you use for an iPhone today. And that was that way they couldn't disturb anyone else by playing, you know, up to 25 of these at a time. He also had the idea to gain publicity for this of having an assistant go around Europe and record famous people's voices at the time. He got Helmut von Moltke, the German military strategist. And the significance of that is, without quite realizing it, they had the only extant sound recording of someone born in the 18th century, not the 19th. It's the only one known at this point. Now, another famous item is the Ferris wheel. Everyone knows, we've all ridden one probably. And most people know it started at the 1893 Expo in Chicago. But there's a story of what almost took its place. Chicago in 1893 wanted to out Eiffel Eiffel. So a, a Spanish architect named Alberto Palacio proposed a 1,000 foot tall, 1,000 foot diameter globe. A circular staircase around it would lead you to the top where you saw a replica of Christopher Columbus's flagship. Because it would have cost the equivalent today of about 130 million, they decided not to go with it. Plus the fact, I don't know if anyone with a fear of heights would be climbing this much. And so they went for Gail Ferris's idea to build a giant version of a wheel that was known in France and other countries, but they would only be, oh, something like 10 feet high. They would be very small. They built one 264 feet high. It took 150 rail cars to transport the parts from steel works, mostly in Pennsylvania, to the fair. Each of the 36 gondolas held 60 people. They weighed as much as two bull elephants. And you'd get nine minutes. Once every, once every gondola was full, you got a nine-minute spin. And I kind of imagine, think how few people would ever, especially in the Midwest, would ever have had a vantage point on looking at something at 260 feet in the air. It itself had to be a rarity. And everyone, uh, L. Frank Baum wrote it. And he was inspired by the White City to write about Oz. It cost you 50 cents to do this, and it was the reason the fair made a profit, because it was so popular that something like 1.4 million people wrote it, and it put the fair into the black. 1904 exposition, the Louisiana Purchase Exposition in St. Louis, uh, popularized another technology that most people don't really know about, infant incubators. People were technophobes about it. The technology had been invented a few years before, but people still didn't believe it worked. So to convince the public, the 20 million visitors to that fair, they set up a kind of medical looking pavilion, and they actually took preemies and other babies from an orphanage. And they put them in there, in the incubator, with nurses and doctors attending, and you could see them sidle by. As you sidle by, you could watch them and see how they were prospering. Overnight, it changed public sentiment. It's one of the most effective uses of exhibiting and the power of a World's Fair to change public opinion, especially about technology. At the same fair, you got fingerprints because of the 1904 fair. Fingerprinting was new, and it was considered unreliable, and again, it wasn't, it wasn't how we'd done it. The way we'd done it was a system called Bertillonage. It's about 30 years old at that point, and it consisted of very elaborate measurements of criminals' digits, ears, what have you. That was the end all and be all. It was considered high tech of its day. Two firms, one from London, one from New York, exhibited fingerprinting at the fair. Within a couple years, Bertillonage was gone. It made that big an impression that an old system was disrupted overnight. It was a disruptive technology, and this was the perfect forum to hit critical mass for it. 
and it was gone just like that. I mean, not many people today even remember the name Bertillonage, but it was the forensic science of its day. 1939, RCA decides to introduce the color TV. But people think it's a trick, or not the color TV, excuse me, black and white. People think it's a trick. So to convince them it's real, what they do is they make it in transparent boxes so you can see that there's no trickery involved. And this was kind of common for World's Fairs, to reduce anxiety about technology. Most famously, it's been used since the early 30s to prepare us for the coming of robots, as a matter of fact. And it's still popular today in uh, Daewoo, had an exhibit in 2012 at Ye Yosu, South Korea, where they now shrink the size of the robots so that you're not as scared of them physically. We used to go for these seven and eight foot tall versions, but now they've kind of decided that a childlike size is more conducive to welcoming robots in the labor pool. 1964, Ford was going to introduce the Mustang. Lee Iacocca was in charge of that project. He had been given 45 million out of about 75 million he requested to build it. And he was not too sure about its success given his tight budget. He decided to launch it at the World's Fair, even though it would have cut probably the year by in half by the time the fair debuted. But what you did is you walked up an escalator, by a revolving Ford Mustang, and you climbed on a conveyor belt with 160 Ford convertibles, 12 of which were Mustangs. And people clamored for the Mustangs, believe me. You rode this diorama of human history around. You had animatronic dinosaurs. It was a Jurassic Park scene of a T-Rex fighting a Stegosaurus and other primitive scenes that were not necessarily relevant, but it was part of a great show that you, that you could see here. And in the first week that the Ford Mustang debuted, it sold 22,000 cars. And again, we're talking 50 years ago. In its first abbreviated year, it sold 100,000. The World's Fair is considered the greatest launching pad for a car ever. But more than items, more than toys, World's Fairs, especially American World Fairs, gave us the future. We're the only ones who've ever done Futuramas, where we gave you a kind of integrated version of what a better world would look like. So for 1939, GM sponsored the Futurama, where you rode around a, con a kind of an upper, ver uh, uh, upper level conveyor belt in a chair around a 35,000 foot diorama with 500,000 buildings in the diorama and 50,000 cars. To show you what the world of 1960 would look like, it was a cleaned up, automated, highly integrated version of what we would have. And it was so popular that they repeated it in 1964, except with a version about five times the size of it. And what they went for were moon bases and undersea bases, and of kind of a feeling of, again, techno-optimism, that the world was going to be a better place. Now, we might think it's a little naive today, and perhaps it is, but it's the only, only World's Fairs where we really tried to sell people on the idea of the future itself. And in fact, the only, this, the 64 version was very popular, the most popular. The only thing that came close to it was Michelangelo's Pieta, which uh, drew about 17 million people all by itself. But again, that could only be outdone by a Futurama exhibit. Finally, I just want to kind of conclude and say that as we're attempting to bring back World's Fair to the country, people often ask me, isn't it irrelevant in an age of screens? I mean, we, we navigate everything through a screen, right? But I kind of compare it to, it's a difference between seeing a movie about Woodstock and having been there to watch Jimi Hendrix live on electric guitar, there's a wee bit of a difference. Or maybe a more up-to-date image is simply this. You can go on OK Cupid all you like, but you're never going to replace dating with it. Face-to-face -face is its own reality. Face-to-face -face is its own power. And as several neurological studies actually tend to back that up. For the 1893 Expo, there were a series of ads that encouraged people to mortgage their houses again to afford going to the fair.
Well, since 25% of America saw it, I guess it was successful. I like to think that the next expo we have here, we'd be willing to mortgage our homes again to go see it. Thank you. Hi, my name's Paul Kirvin. Hi, Paul. Hi, I'm uh, USIA Exhibit Service. Okay. And I, have you been to the Hill with this show? <laughs> no. The White House? No. No, I have not been. I would like, I would like to do that. I, I honestly believe that World's Fairs are an extraordinary opportunity to tell the world who you are and to give the world a better version of things. Lately, lately, a lot of the vibe of World Fairs is kind of ecological canary in the coal mine. And I understand that, and it's for good reason. But I think we've lost the idea of optimism. I think we've lost the idea of what we can do with them. I mean, if Minnesota had won the 2023 fair, the theme would have been health-related. So imagine if you could get a few million people trying out <laughs> new medical devices from local companies there like 3M and Medtronic. What if you could try out the contact lenses that let you record video or see telescopically? What if you could try out the hearing aids that instead of making you look old, allow you to hear at ultra long ranges and on wavelengths humans normally can't? What if you could try out the tricorder, you know, from Star Trek, which is actually on the drawing board and almost ready? What if you could have the estimated 12 million who would show up try those technologies? That's a better world. And again, it's a live collective experience that you cannot replicate through a screen. Anyone else? Hi there. Uh, thank you. This was very interesting. Thank you. If you had to make a guess, when do you think that the World's Fair will return to the United States, and would you have a city in mind? I think, I'd, depending on when it's scheduled, let's say 2027, 2028, I think we could get it as soon as that. Um, I, I, after rejoining the Bureau of International Expositions, that makes it a lot easier to do. I mean, you could go ahead and do it, but it's very difficult to do it without their support. Once we've done that, we've curried a lot of world favor in that sense, and there would be support. Minneapolis has a head start because they've done this once now, and they would have an inside track on doing it again. I think in LA, if they wanted it, would have, you know, it's, it's got a certain allure to it. I think that would, that would help. A New York could, mainly because of historical allure and because everyone's familiar with it. But right now, I would almost say Minneapolis has a very, very good shot because I haven't seen others talk about it. New Orleans, again, might, a Miami might. Big urban area, but has to be willing to put in the infrastructure to actually make it work, to garner political support in your state, but also nationally because you're wanting to launch that host city and therefore the country even more in the world's eye. And you need a lot of foreign participation. I mean, you need them to buy into the idea of going to Minneapolis, which being from Minnesota or Minnesota, you know, it's, it's, it's not that cold, especially in the summer. It's actually very, very warm. But you'd have, you'd, have those, you'd have those problems and hurdles, you know, to go over. But I think they could actually do it. And it would be kind of neat to see a slightly different city gain it, because New Orleans has had it, New York. Chicago actually would be a good candidate. I think they might have the energy, the cultural capital, and the political clout also to bring it in if they so wanted to. And if I can just add on that, again, Matthew Sada from the Expo Unit. Um, one of the things is that now that the United States is back in the Bureau of International Expositions, we're casting votes for cities um, who will be the next host. So in November of, 2020, November of this year, the United States will be voting for one of three countries, Japan, Russia, or Azerbaijan, as the host for the 2025 World's Fair. And as the legislation has been set up, uh, as it relates to a US bid, 
the Department of Commerce is responsible for certifying the national bid, the national candidate. So one of these cities that was mentioned, it could very well be Minneapolis, Minnesota, that comes along again. But the next opportunity to host would be the 27-28, a smaller fair, a three-month fair, not a six-month like Dubai or Milan. Or the next big one would be in 2030. Um, again, so 27-28 or 2030. But most likely, this means that in 2019, i.e. next year, there'll be some type of conversation as to which US city wants to come forward. And then we would have to go through a certification process that commerce would lead. And then once we have a national candidate, that's when the State Department takes over to build the international support for the candidacy. Great, thank you. Just a follow-on question. So as well as the uh, when and where um, for the next potential World's Fair here in the United States, you already suggested if Minnesota was to have had it, they would have had the theme of uh, health care or health yes. technology. Yes. What would be some other themes that you would see an American city being very successful with? I think one similar to the ones coming up in Dubai, actually, which is about connecting people, connecting minds. And you can kind of extrapolate from that the technology and other things that might be represented at the fair. I see, I see it reflecting technology very directly. So again, Internet of Things maybe 100 billion devices connected by 2020, connecting therefore people. Health technology is going to be massive. Imagine what CRISPR, the gene editing technology, might mean in the next few years. But we'd see that reflected, let's say five to 10 years from now. Imagine how far in advance it's gonna be and what you could do to promote those things at a World's Fair. So I see it, again, as interconnection through technology and health technology being two of the likely, likely sources that we'd have at World's Fair, and energy production. Depending, again, on how things change in the next several years, I could see that also as being a theme that's been around in World's Fairs for several years, but I could see us expanding on it, reflecting tech change. As I showed in some of the examples, sometimes we get way ahead of the curve. Other times, we're trying to allay people's fears about it, which I think is something where health tech in particular could be effectively demonstrated because, again, you're talking about does it work? Is it useful? Does it make me look like an idiot? Um, you know, is it expensive? But what if you had millions being able to try it out? What that would do, just from the pure perspective of industry, much less to the betterment of people itself, what that could do. And that's where I think World's Fairs excel, and we can do that again. Hi. Uh, Samir Rashad, thanks again. This is very enlightening. Um, with things like virtual reality, I mean, you talked about, you know, there's nothing like being there face to face, but with things like virtual, virtual reality, and you're saying this is even almost a decade, over a decade out, uh, what might be the impact of uh, things like, te like technology and virtual reality on um, the ability to attend it? Maybe instead of millions, you're just talking about billions of attendees, and you're not talking about live, you're talking about uh, something that lives on almost forever, indefinitely, as long as you have the internet, you can save the, uh, you know, the ex exhibits online, that's a good point. Um, what, are the, what do you think could be the impact of technology on that's, attendance? That's a great question. That's a great question. Right now, I'd say it would, if you use what you had today, I would say it would be nil for this reason. If you've ever used virtual reality, especially in a group setting, what does it consist of? You put out a helmet and you're aware of everyone's probably looking at you while you kind of move your head around like that, right? It's a very socially uncomfortable and not very much fun experience in many ways. The visuals can be interesting, but they still have a way to go. But let's say with 10 years development, you'd have to move ahead in two areas. One is haptic, that is the ability to feel things. The other is lag time, so that when you move your head, it moves like it, you know, everything shifts the way it does in real life instead of, a, instead of a lag, because motion sickness is a huge problem in anyone who uses VR for any length of time. And if you're thinking about you know, putting thousands of people a day through something, 
that's a lot to consider. If those two things are ironed out, I would see them not replacing, but as an adjunct to the experience. Because you're right, if you can't afford to fly from Morocco to Minneapolis, but you could experience it to some degree, at least visually, you could see a lot of the things, that would be worth it. And yes, and it's almost like, I, I liken that, that experience to casinos. Vegas used to worry about states getting their own casinos, right? What they found out, though, is it's a feeder system because it's, it'll never be as cool as Vegas itself. But you get used to it, you're comfortable with it, and then you decide to go to Vegas someday. I think technology would work with World's Fairs in a similar vein. You would get people used to it, expose them to it, and at some point, whether at one of the big ones or one of the smaller ones, and depending where it is, they might be able to attend. But again, to disseminate the view of it, the idea of it, I think with some developments, some advances, VR could be actually very helpful and very useful rather than a, rather than a kind of a clunky, poor man's version of it. But yeah, give it about 10 years development before I think that's really possible. Yeah, very interesting, you know, I mean, I, I'm battling inside of myself because on the one hand, I'm, I'm hearing the optimism that comes with the notion of a World's Fair and, and, and then I'm thinking about the borders being shut, you know, and, and then I'm thinking about visa policies and who, who will be allowed to, to come to this World's Fair in Minneapolis is a question that occurs to me. And then, and then is it a world's, for whom is this World's Fair being um, developed? The, uh, when you talk of going, wanting to go to Congress and to the White House, again, I, you know, occupants change and so on, but, but the question of how we address our visa policies and how, and do, will we give a free pass to anyone who applies to go to the World's Fair, such as we might do with, uh, well, let's say, the World Cup when it comes to Canada, US, and Mexico, I, I, or what kind of free pass? I think How free? You've you know? touched on a very important area. It is a World's Fair, and it should be open to as many people who want to come can come. You're right. I don't know the specifics of how that would be handled or what the, you know, what the complications would be, but you're right. I mean, the whole nature of it is to be inclusive, not exclusive. And that's something we're going to have to iron out in, in many ways. I'll give you an example. When I went to Shanghai in 2010, we had to go through an enormous number of hurdles to get in as press. We weren't particularly loved there, let's put it that way. And you know, our presence wasn't necessarily wanted, as it were. So I get a, I get a sense of when a nation is somewhat ambivalent or even sometimes you know, a little bit touchy about your being there, it makes it difficult to go there. And it, makes, and it was my job, and I liked it. But if I were a tourist and I were having the same problem, I might think twice if I were having to jump over a bunch of hurdles. You're right. So however it turns out, yes, we do need to address that and work with it so it can draw in as many people as possible. That's the point of them. Because also, we're selling ourselves, and we want to put our best foot forward at those. Back. Uh, thanks, Mr. Pappas. Uh, book and talk very interesting. I know you talked about this a little bit in, in near the end, but my understanding is most of these world's fairs have lost money. And what is your reaction to people say, you know, the world's fairs are something like Olympic Games? It costs the cities and the countries a lot of money to build and put on, and uh, versus what are the benefits? Right. It can lose you a lot of money. And part of what I'm showing today, the subtext you might consider to be, if you want it to be successful, these are the things and approaches and the template to use. You're right. New Orleans in 84 was a disaster. It went bankrupt before the fair was even over. Others, though, like Shanghai, even do make money because, again, of infrastructure repair and how they're planning for post expo life in terms of business, increasing business on a world stage. That's why Chicago ultimately made money in New York did because they also redid their infrastructure at those times. That's what makes for a successful fair. If you treat it just like a carnival, no, you're right. You're not going to do well with it at all. 
It needs to have all these various elements to work well and be profitable. And not just per se, you know, at the end of the fair, do we have one dollar more than we spent, but rather, is it going to pay off directly because of what we've done with the infrastructure here? The Chinese spent somewhere between 55 and as maybe as much as 90 billion dollars on their infrastructure. It showed. There's a maglev train that they built to go from the airport into the city. I mean, they really meant business. But that was part of it. It was a national policy to launch themselves on a world stage and to reap the benefits of improved infrastructure after the fair was over. And I think that's, that's part of the key with it, is if you do it sloppy and pell-mell, no, you're going to lose money. You're right. And it will, it will be for nothing. But the elements are there. There is a template to do it right and to profit that city, that region, and that country with it. Any other questions? I, oh. Lady in back. Thank you. Um, my name is Tanya Mendez, and I'm an intern. Um, my question was, who is really the intended design for this fair? Who is the ultimate consumer of the World Fair? Are we considering it states, um, the average individual consumer, or maybe institutions of learning? that uh, might disseminate this information? That's a great question because there are so many different answers. For instance, in Dubai coming up, maybe 70 to 80 percent of the attendees will be from outside the country, more, more or less. Shanghai, mostly it was Chinese, often rural, but again, 75 million people, mostly Chinese. It has to be defined by each fair, what they're aiming for. You know, partly, you know, this percentage ideally might be domestic. We could draw as many as these people, you know, from outside. So if you had a fair, let's say, in New York or L.A., a coastal fair, you're probably likely to get more international audience for a number of reasons, ease of travel, the logistics, familiarity with the city. But nonetheless, there are certain levels you always want. One of those is, yes, international, because, again, it's a world's fair. Two, you do want just the average person, the average consumer. You, who rode the Ferris wheel? Who looked at TVs? Who was looking at fingerprinting? It was really, you know, just the average Joe. But it's not only educational institutions, let's say, it's, let's say corporate and educational institutions, because you're twi trying to sway them with this new technology or this new idea. One of my favorites is 1893. Frederick Jackson Turner gave the speech on his thesis, The Closing of the American Frontier, one of the most famous pieces of historical scholarship in this country. Now, it's much debated today and you know, kind of put down quite a bit. But in terms of its effect, you can't really argue that it was monumental. He gave it at a speech at a hot July night in the Art Institute building to the Historians Society. Do you know nobody wrote about it? Nobody mentioned it? He was this lowly 20-something-year-old guy. What could he possibly know? They missed the boat on it. But think how if they had understood how influential he might have been even more so. So they are, they are trying to convince many people on many different levels, including and that's very important, educational ones. But they don't always get it right. So the 1851 fair, one of the organizers was Charles Babbage, the inventor of the differential engine, a proto-computer. He could not get the fair to finance putting a version in the fair, because it was just too woo-woo. They missed as much as they got. They got voting machines. They had an early fax machine there. They had the Colt revolver. They had flush toilets there. I mean, for the time, they had cutting edge technology. But like the solar power in 1878, they missed the boat on it. And that's one thing I think expos have to take a look at is what we include, what we don't include. But be sure you think twice about what you keep out is too fanciful. 
And again, why? You're, you're convincing different segments of society, including institutional, from education to corporate, about what these changes are and should be. We have time for one more question. Okay, if not. I just wanted to um, say to some of the questions here in the audience about you know what can be done and how competitive might the United States be in attracting a mega global event like this that you know this administration has put a lot of emphasis on this type of activity I mean it was President Trump that signed the legislation that helped get it through to get back into this international organization we know that he himself you know from Queens was attended the 64 World's Fair in New York and had very fond memories of that and went on to build again the Unisphere at one of his uh, properties there in the city but I think more recently you saw this, you know, the World Cup bid that you referenced, that the international community is able to come behind and support U.S. efforts to host activities like this. And so, um, you know, we're, we're getting back into the game, having not been in the organization since 2002, and whether it's Minneapolis, whether it's, you know, San Francisco, Governor Schwarzenegger at that time, he went out to Shanghai in 2010, and he said he wanted to bring the World's Fair back to San Francisco. They ultimately were not able to get us into the BIE, which is why kind of that bid, you know, never, you know, really went forward. But, you know, we're at the very beginning of this journey. And so I think over the next couple of years, you're going to start to see cities that take a look at this, this administration will try to see what it can do to support these efforts, because at the end of the day, what Again, it's an economic activity, it's a nation branding activity, and even for Minneapolis or Minnesota, we saw the influx of foreign visitors as well as the commercial um, associated activity that goes along with it to be a real worthwhile event here for our country. So again, we want to thank you know, Mr. Pappas for coming out here from Minnesota thank to you. join us. Thank you. Thank you. And we hope to welcome a lot of you to Dubai in 2020 to visit the U.S. Pavilion there. Thanks a lot. Thank you.